So what I'll talk about today is the intersection between evolutionary biology and medicine. And if anyone ever asks you, what does a study of evolution have to do with medicine? You just point to snake venom, of course, because those dynamic diversifications are exactly what makes it a nightmare. So as many people have already spoken about at this conference, and it's not exactly a ground shaking finding, you know, we know that venom varies tremendously between different species, even closely related species within populate or between populations of the same species or different life stages of the same species. Now, unraveling these aspects are what makes them so much fun from an evolutionary biologist perspective. So when I'm wearing that hat, I love it. But when I'm looking at it from the perspective of influencing clinical pathologies, you know, this dynamic diversification is correspondingly deeply concerning. So what makes them such sources of novel compounds and such evolutionary novelties makes them clinical nightmares. So we'll look at, for example, the comparing the brown snakes versus the type ants, where these are very closely related snakes. Genetically, they actually differ less than between the most distant species of rattlesnakes or the most distant species of other big genre like Bothrops. So you could actually put them in the same genus and have less genetic diversification, but morphologically and ecologically, they're very, very distinct from each other. And we see this like on the lower right there, a very crude look at the venom of just one dimensional gels, classic you know, SDS page, larger components towards the top, smaller towards the bottom. It passes the bloody obvious test that babies and adults have identical venoms. And this fits with the fact that they occupy identical ecological niches where the babies are basically mini me's. They are big headed, you know, a little bit outside you know, their head in fact as babies, big headed babies that just like the adults are daytime active mammal specialists from the get go. So it's unsurprising that the venom is identical and therefore the antivenom is perfectly appropriate for all age groups. In contrast, Baby brown snakes are tiny. I have literally had larger intestinal parasites come out of my butt in the field than are the size of baby brown snakes. They are very challenging to milk, as Christina can attest to. They're nocturnal lizard specialists. And as you can see there in the lower left, they're banded colored, which is a classic form for a nocturnal animal, not from the offensive warning, but rather the fact that banding in a nocturnal animal gives a flicker fusion effect and makes them very hard to see. In contrast, as they become adults, the color and pattern changes quite radically, where if you didn't know these are the same snake, you would think that they were unrelated animals entirely, let alone you know, age variants of the same species. Mammal, the adults are mammal specialists and they have a blood acting venom. Now this is reflected yet again in 1D gels quite starkly where the baby of the, uh, we had two different species shown there are radically different than the adults. They are very poor in mid molecular weight com compounds, lacking entirely high molecular weight compounds. They have no action on the blood in contrast to the devastating action that the parents have on the blood. And even more concerning is the fact that since the venom is made using the venom of the adults, and the adults are very poor, relatively speaking, in the neurotoxins and the classic paradigm, as we know, larger molecular weight compounds generate antibodies much more efficiently. So the stoichiometry is always skewed towards higher molecular weight compounds, a big issue in a lot of snakes. But in this case, it means that the venom of the babies is very unlikely to be neutralized by the adult venom or anti-venom. So this is one of the things we're going to do as a follow-up study is actually confirm that hypothesis that the baby venom is poorly neutralized. And then we'll investigate other aspects where, all right, they're secreting these three finger toxins in very high amounts. Is this neutralized by a three finger toxin rich stimulated antivenom such as death adder? So follow-up studies to test, but it certainly points to an issue and we know that baby brown snakes can kill. Now there's been bite report or deaths linked to snakes as little as 15 or 20 centimeters. So size doesn't really matter in this case. 
Now, expanding more broadly outwards and looking at the action on the blood, the ability to be pro-coagulant through the use of factor 10A as a toxin is a basal trait unique to Australian lapids. This, this trait evolved after Micropicus split off and is present in all the other lineages to some extent or another. But as you can see from this tree where the lineages in red are those that are pro-coagulant, as you can see, it's been amplified on multiple independent occasions. Now, this is important because brown snake and taipan antivenoms don't cross-react with each other. So therefore, what are our therapeutic options for these other snakes? Now, there's all secreting a more basal form of the procoagulant venoms, which is characterized just by factor 10A versus the Pseudonia and Oxyuranus, which have 10A and 5A in the venom. So a very different venom biochemistry. So some very nice work by Christina as part of her PhD thesis, looking at the action of the tiger snake antivenom and that clade second from the bottom there, Noticus is a stimulating venom. As you can see, it does cross react, but phylogenetic positioning is not a guide. So the, while hemiaspis is neutralized, it's the closest relative and it's the most poorly neutralized relative to the extraordinary neutralization of Pseudicus porphyriacus, much more towards the top. So here we have a huge variation in regards to relative antivenom neutralization capacity and phylogenetic positioning. So organismal relationships is a very poor indicator of antivenom cross-reactivity is the take home there. Aspects we've seen in other snakes, such as some work that Jordan de Bono did on Trimerosaurus, showing that the best and poorest neutralized snakes did not correspond to their relative position to the stimulating venom, Trimerosaurus alba labris. All right, so moving on to another aspect of that is work that we did on the spitting cobras, looking at the relative amounts of cytotoxicity and the action on the blood in re relationship to the wounding, the ability to destroy tissue, the cytotoxicity itself. Now, the key here is that it's not related to the spitting behavior where spitting as a trait in the dark brown vertical bars there, as you can see, has evolved three separate times. Hooding has evolved on two separate occasions. And what we have seen, however, is that there's an evolution of these wounding toxins linked to the hooding trait, where we see these wounding toxins evolving independently in our two lineages, where our so-called true cobras and the Naya hematatus clade evolved hooding independent of our various king cobras down there in the bottom. Now, the relationship is that as the hooding is the basal sort of stimulus in this regard, we see an increase in these wounding toxins, not linked to the spitting behavior, but actually linked to warning markings, to aposematic markings. So in the Asian non-spitters, such as in the Nyanaya genus, the, we see a dramatic increase in species such as Nyanaya, the iconic spectacled cobra with its very ornate and extraordinarily conspicuous markings is much more potent with these wounding toxins than, for example, Nyahaya there, a very good representation of sort of the basal morphology where on the front of the hood, there's a little bit of eye-catching marking, but nothing dramatic and nothing on the back of the hood. Now we also see an increase with color. So in the lineages and the African spitting cobra clade that are bright red uh, uh, markings of some sort or another, we see an increase in the level. So yet again, linked to aposematic markings. And within our king cobras of uh, the Malaysian species, which you know, the king cobras are a multiple species group. Um, Gauri Shanka has his paper in press that will absolutely explode people's minds. But in the Malaysian one, it's the only of the kings that has the bright orange markings, you know, aposematic markings, and it's also much more potent in its type of wounding toxins relative to the other king cobras. So we're seeing that biological honesty of warning colorings being linked to this chemical Krav Maga. Similarly, with the classic banding of these are daytime an active animals, so these are aposematics warning of this bumblebee-like banding, 
within our African non-spitting cobras, our most potent in this regard of these wounding toxins was the banded cobra, one of the snouted cobra types that had, you know, yet again, an increase in these toxins level. Similarly, we see it in other occasions, even in ones like in the lower left there, where that's a, the zebra cobra, Nyronigusincta, that's located within a group of red cobras. Now, secondary reversals of a trait are just as informative as derivation. So on two independent occasions within very ornately marked Asian snakes, we see a reversal back to the drab camouflage type markings. And in both of these cases, they absolutely tanked in regards to their relative level of these wounding toxins. And in the case of Philippinensis, virtually a complete disappearance of these toxins. We also see it with the uh, water cobras, which are no longer using um, hooding as a trait for bluffing. They just bail straight into the water when encountering a predator. So that brings us back to what's going on, you know, why the African spitters. So we looked at the blood side of things of where if they're unremarkable in that, yes, they have a large amount of these wounding toxins, but so do a lot of other cobras that don't cause those characteristic um, diffuse tissues damage states, what's going on there? And sure enough, the African spitting cobras are unique among the cobras in being very potently anticoagulant, and there has actually been a clinical death report from hemorrhage. So with this, if we look at them, they're both, they're inhibiting both thrombin and factor 10A, but it's particularly 10A that they are just mind blowing in their potency on. So extremely potent inhibitors of 10A. Now there's a problem, the antivenom doesn't work. It has virtually no effect on these uh, anticoagulant toxins. However, following on Matt Lewin's extraordinarily clever idea to use Verespidib, we tested that and sure enough, Verespidib absolutely nukes these toxins. And uh, we have follow -up, a follow-up paper in um, review at the moment, looking at all the, the full taxonomical range of the African spitting cobras, including species like Ashai and Catiensis uh, and Nubiae and looking at Verespidib and other inhibitors for their ability. And Verespidib remains, from a molarity perspective, it's the best one out there as far as that. Now, a different story is with the um, Echis genus of vipers, the soul scale vipers, which are arguably one of the most medically important, if not the most medically important genus of viper in North Africa, through the Middle East and Indian, into the Indian subcontinent well-known for being very potent on the blood, on procoagulant, prothrombin activating. Now, the problem is, is that they, there's two very good antivenoms um, widely available, very variety of other ones in experimental stages of different sorts, but looking at the ICP, which is made using West African antivenom or West African venoms, works brilliantly against West African snakes, the South African one is made with like a two to one ratio between East and West, has a Pan-African coverage, but works best against the East. And then moving on to looking at what's going on, that's where the real tragedy, and David Worrell is actually one of the people who wrote one of the first articles about this deplorable practice, where the Indian antivenoms are being sold in Africa without any preclinical testing, which to me is negligence at best. And people like David reported a 20 fold increase in deaths. We tested the antivenom and sure enough, a complete and utter failure against anything from Africa, failed even against one of the main subspecies in India. So the Echis carinatus from North India it failed against. Um, the the Shokareki subspecies it works great against, which is unsurprising since that's the one most likely being supplied by Ron Whitaker. So here's a case of where Indian antivenom has problems even within India, let alone in Africa. We sent our results prior to publication to the manufacturers and a myriad of Indian antivenom manufacturers were shown in a subsequent study by um, Rob Harrison and other people from Liverpool to still be shut, um, selling their antivenoms in Africa, despite knowing that they fail, which to me is murder. You know, it was manslaughter at best before, this is murder. 
you sell something that's putatively a life-saving product, but their attitude is caveat, you know, buyer beware, you know, that they really do not care. And this is tragically far from being unique in regards to the predatory practices inflicted upon the developing world. So thank you very much. Um, this particular study, um, so he's mentioned in addition to my amazing group of students at UQ, uh, collaborators at various other universities. And of course, we always have to finish with a fossil cartoon that is, I believe, um, required. So thank you very much.